Welcome everyone to our webinar today on coaching to increase grit and resiliency in sales teams. Uh, we have quite a few people joining us today. So while we're waiting for them to um, enter the Zoom, just make a, a housekeeping note that today's webinar will be recorded uh, and sent out to all attendees, everyone that registered and that should go out later today. If you have any technical issues or difficulties, um, please reach out to our um, uh, host and panelists through the chat, and our producer, Alan, will be happy to assist you. As we're going through, uh, please feel free to enter your questions or your comments, thoughts, feedback uh, in the chat or through the Q&A. We really want to, to engage with you. Uh, we want to hear from you and see what your thoughts are on this subject. So we're going to dig in. Again, we're talking about coaching to increase grit and resiliency in sales teams. And I am thrilled to have my co-host, Russ Scherer, with us today. Uh, if you've been uh, joining our webinars over the last couple of years, you know that uh, Russ is a regular contributor. He is our chief sales officer. And I know that he's got some great insights to share with us as well. Welcome, Russ. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Uh, I think as I talk to our clients over and over again, I hear this as sort of the, the key thing that they face in 2023 is how do I keep my teams going? They're, they're tired from the last three years. They're stressed from the last three years. Um, I think some research we did earlier, uh, I guess late last year, said that something like 70% of uh, those surveyed had increases in quotas heading into uh, what appears to continue to be uncertain economic times. And so uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to, to talking today. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I found in looking at this, there's a, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania whose name is Angela Duckworth. And she actually said that in her research, grit is a better predictor of success than talent or intelligence in different jobs. And so anything we can do to grow that skill is going to help us and help our teams. So I'm looking forward to the next uh, the next few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually had the um, pleasure of seeing Angela Duckworth speak at a conference a couple of years ago on grit. And it was um, really an interesting presentation. She said the same thing that you just did. Um, so this really does feel like an important topic. And it's something that I think our um, our clients, all the sales leaders out there can really relate to. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about resilience and grit defined. Um, signs that someone is struggling with resiliency. We're going to talk about some tools maybe that you can use to, um, to assess whether your folks have grit, what their, their level of resiliency is. And we're going to talk about how to foster a resilient environment and then how to coach resilience. So we're excited to share this information with you, the insights that we've learned um, from customers, our own research, as well as the tools that uh, we have that can, can offer. And again, add those comments to chat and be sure to include um, questions. So just getting started, Russ alluded to this uh, early on in his opening remarks that there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And so what are we worried about? So Harris Poll and Fast Company did a survey back in December, so a little over a month ago, a thousand adults. And these were the things that are top of mind for them. The economy, no surprise, we're hearing a lot about that. Personal finances, global events, domestic events, and the new year in general, like half of the, the folks that responded just were um, anxious about a brand new year. And so that's the, uh, the population as a whole. As Russ mentioned, um, our research showed we have 78% um, of sales organizations looking at higher targets. 29% of our survey respondents are already trending behind those targets for Q1. And the biggest issues uh, on everyone's mind, again, the economy, um, inflation, many folks are dealing with price increases, still dealing with supply chain um, issues. They've got turnover, new employees. So there's just a whole host of things that people are, are worried about. 
And so that's going to infect, affect our ability to be um, gritty, to re be resilient, to bounce back, and really it, it impacts how we um, face adversity. So let's look at what is actually resilience and grit defined. And Russ, I know you've got um, some definitions here. Sure. So the, the first one comes from uh, the American Psychological Association. It's this idea of not just the process of sort of hanging in there, but the outcome of just being able to deal with the circumstances we've experienced. And if anything, uh, and we've talked about this previously, the last three or four years have created sort of this overall complexity of stress on us. And so um, even uh, as, as we go out into the new year, we're still carrying the, the concerns of um, you know, battles and, and illnesses and everything else. Uh, and then grit's slightly different. Grit is sort of that passion or that ability to sustain um, the effort it takes to achieve a goal over the very long term. And uh, it, it sometimes is tied to rewards, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes grit just says, we're going to make this happen and we're going to press on regardless. So that's kind of the difference between the two of them. Great. And, you know, what's really striking to me is, you know, we're really talking about, um, again, the mental, emotional, behavioral flexibility. Um, this is a lot about self-awareness and, and really our own mindset and, and how we approach these um, these types of situations and adversity even. So our mindset matters. And here's a little bit of data just to, to give folks a, a perspective on how important and, uh, our mindset is and really how it can impact our overall outlook. And I think then that also influences um, our ability to be resilient. Uh, so this is research from a variety of, of sources. And I also want to acknowledge um, um, a presentation from the Kellogg Institute at uh, Northwestern University, um, who also compiled some of this data. So our minds wander for 47% of our waking hours, and this actually makes us unhappy. So research from Harvard says that um, on average, our mind wanders almost half of our waking hours, and we don't like this, and yet it still happens. We average 6,200 thoughts per day. And most of those are negative or they're repetitive. We have a negativity bias and our brains focus on bad news over good. So research indicates that our brain processes bad news faster and it stores it faster than good news. So we have a bias towards that, that negative information. However, research shows that 85% of what we worry about actually never happens. And the 15% that does happen, people would say turn out better than they expected, or they learned a very valuable lesson from going through that. So our mindset, in essence, um, you know, we have a lot of thoughts, our mind is wandering, we're focusing on the negative, and at the same time, uh, what we're worried about, what we're anxious and uncertain about, 85% of the time never even comes to pass. So that's going to impact our ability to be resilient, resilient and how we approach um, long-term goals and our ability to persevere through situations. Uh, we're getting a couple of great questions, Michelle. One around the idea mm -hmm. of like some people learned uh, grit and hanging in there uh, as teens or, or maybe in college when we were uh, struggling through a class or uh, in our first job when we were trying to really be successful. And, and the question is, can we learn it in our uh, uh, as adults? And uh, I want to really say that grid is a mindset, as you've just said, so we can continually enhance it. I don't think it's an attribute like we have it or we don't have it. I see grid as uh, in layers of degree. And yes, we can work on our mindset to improve our grid. Um, and that's why we're talking about some people who struggle with the idea of resilience. These are some ideas from uh, a really uh, what I consider to be a great book from last year, Susan David's Emotional Agility. But it talks about this idea of uh, the book itself uh, on kind of how do we bring the right mindsets? Uh, how do we not get locked into certain perspectives? And so if you've got people on your team who are struggling re with resilience, you see some of these things, right? They have to be right no matter what. 
uh, or maybe they just they tune out. Either they become apathetic or just silent in terms of what's going on. Um, maybe it turns out that that they just go uh, focus in on the on the very little little insignificant things. There's a there's a great movie. Uh, it's an old movie. It's even older than I am. But from 1954, starring one of my favorite actors, Humphrey Bogart. Uh, it's called The Kane Mutiny. And many of us, if you have seen the clip, if you haven't, go to YouTube. Uh, just uh, Google cane mutiny and strawberries. And you can see that as the world is sort of coming apart around Humphrey Bogart, he is totally focused on who has stolen his strawberries. You know, he's he's focused on those small tasks and totally losing the bigger picture. Uh, so it's a great pic image of uh, of someone who's struggling with resiliency. Um, you know, sometimes you see it come out in sarcasm or backhanded comments. Uh, and then especially when we start to rely upon stereotypes, we don't do the, the cognitive work, the thinking about the environments and the situations that we're in. And as a result of that, um, we're doing that because the, the, the lack of resilience and the lack of grit has caused us to just sort of stop thinking. All right, so here are some signs of uh, that you can actually look out for, right, with resiliency, trying to understand um, whether you have a team member who is struggling. But what about tools? And there are other ways, obviously, than just observation that we can, can kind of diagnose or uh, get an idea that someone may have some, some issues or, or weaknesses there. If you have worked with the Brooks Group at all, you know that our assessments are a powerful tool um, for self-awareness, for coaching. And um, these are tools that we can help use um, to identify areas of, of resilience and even grit. So the Brooks Talent Index, um, one of those factors is personal skills that really does speak to overall uh, mental focus, mental clarity, and resiliency is one of the personal skills that we measure. And self-starting ability would be another one that I would kind of lean towards, um, kind of pointing towards that grit factor. I see a lot of assessments. I work with organizations um, in this way, and resiliency is one of those that that tends to trend low. Um, this one is really all about kind of your uh, your team members internal focus, um, kind of where their mindset is. If they're disengaged, um, if they're struggling, then that resiliency um, factor will be impacted. Another tool would be our emotional intelligence assessment. And you know that really measures someone's self self-awareness. Um, their ability to regulate their emotions, their ability to feel empathy. Um, and it also looks at motivation. And so the motivation on EQ is really talking about and looking at your internal drive, your ability to persevere. And so these types of tools can help um, sales leaders um, really get a sense of kind of the, the current capacities of their team. And again, we work with a lot of organizations and teams really helping them understand um, where the mindset of their team is and ideas for coaching and, and potential areas where some additional development is needed. So these can be a great tool to kind of help back up your hunch, right? You, if you're observing some of those, um, those signs that Russ just talked about with resiliency, these can kind of provide a little bit more data and kind of a jumping off point for, for coaching. And, and what I love about that personal skills assessment, Michelle, is that, uh, you know, in it, it's not that we either have the skill or don't, but sometimes things get in our way. They block our ability to practice that skill. And so when you see resiliency or self-starting kind of drop to the bottom, there's something that's uh, that in the in the business life or in the personal life or in the just environment of that person that's getting in their way. Uh, same thing you see it in, in EQ in terms of motivation mm -hmm. or their ability to self-regulate. Yeah, and it's it's kind of proof in a way that um, these types of skills really can be coached and developed, right? We do have some that are innate, but areas where we place focus or where our direct reports place focus uh, can be developed and um, you know can uh, move along and, and improve over time. So how do we foster a resilient environment? 
So I think there's kind of a couple of aspects here. I mean, we've, we've talked about the problem. Let's get onto the solution and kind of how we really help our people to be more resilient and to practice grit. And there's kind of two big components of that. There's a relational component uh, as well as there's some technical components. And, um, you know, one of the key principles that we teach actually in impact is that relationships need to be built upon trust. And never is that more important than if you're going to try and encourage your team. You want to make sure that you've got the right relationship to move them forward. Um, number one, really having that sort of right culture with the right social support. A lot of the work on resiliency goes back and looked at POWs in Vietnam. And uh, there was an individual whose name was uh, Robert Shoemaker. He was an admiral. He was the one credited with creating the tap code that most of us have heard about, where prisoners kept in isolation by, by tapping on the wall or, uh, or, or tapping on the bamboo bars, could communicate one with another. And the research has shown that that ability to, to not be isolated, to feel like even though you're alone physically, that there's other people there, was something that really contributed towards the, the positive mindset of those people who could stick it out. So we need to be in the right culture with the right support. Um, there's the big four, right? Every problem, it seems, uh, traces back to, you know, are we getting enough sleep? Are we getting enough exercise? Do we have the right diet? Uh, are we being cognitively challenged enough, but not too much? Um, and so we, we go to those. And then the last one is there needs to be a clear why in your organization. Uh, if, if there's a purpose beyond just sort of doing the tasks that are in front of them, uh, I find uh, when, when people are under stress, they tend to give a lot of what commands and not a lot of why commands. And so I've been trying to work just in the way in which I interact with my team to drop back and say, well, here's why we're doing this. Here's why this is important. Um, Nishi, um, Nitschke says that he who has a, a why to live for can bear almost anything. Uh, and if you're familiar with Viktor Frankl's work on man's search for meaning, he he has something very similar when he says that, um, that our conception of service as a pillar of meaning is the ability to see life's work as a calling enhances our resilience. It holds true even when people are performing what he called dirty work, jobs such as cleaning hospitals, uh, and for people who've been pursuing, who've been prevented from pursuing their chosen career. This idea of I've got a why, I've got a reason, I'm moving forward. Make sure that's in place before we get into the technical pieces of what it means to coach for resilience. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, I think we um, just in general have a tendency to focus on, you know, the what, go hit your goals, go do this, go do that, as opposed to really um, helping folks understand why it's important or tapping into their why, right, their own motivators and why they want to um, be in a role or take action. Yeah, I was working with a client of ours in the medical space not long ago, and um uh, they had had uh, there was a recognition that a lot of it was go do go do go sell as often happens and we step back in the conversation and just say you know what does our device enable in the lives of the patients um, and we talked about the ability to attend one more wedding or the ability to uh, to to, to a, celebrate one more birthday and that became a more powerful motivator than just one more call one more. Um, sales presentation and discussion, one more unit sold. You need those things. I'm not saying you don't, but I'm also saying you need that bigger why to kind of motivate when, when things are tough. Sure. I also think that could be generational as well. I mean, I think, you know, many of the, uh, if you've got Gen Z on your team or even some millennials, just really tapping into kind of the, the bigger purpose um, and can help get through and kind of break through a lot of that anxiety and, and uncertainty that just so many are feeling right now. Yeah. Uh, we had a question come through the chat. What are the big four to just hit those again? It's sleep, oh, sure. exercise, diet, and then the right level of cognitive load, being challenged, but not being overwhelmed. So how do we coach to resiliency? Um, here's kind of five ideas that, that I have discovered through uh, some research. Um, one is this need to be able to balance sort of optimism, a positive outlook with yet a realistic view of the world. Again, research going back to Vietnam shows that those prisoners who thought, well, we'll be home by Easter or we'll be home by Christmas tended to 
if they weren't um, suffer greater loss, greater uh, greater deaths than those who held this idea of like, I want to be home, but but I can't put a date on it. I don't know. And so one of the things we want to see is the people who understand, especially in sales teams, like, yes, my quota is tough, um, but but I can do the things that I'm doing and I can get there. I like to tell people that uh, if you're carrying an annual quota, my experience is in the first quarter, most people are feeling like, boy, this number is just tough. I don't know any way I can get there. And then the second quarter, there starts to be sort of those green sprouts of maybe. And in the third quarter, our optimism tends to grow. And, and then for most sales folks um, in that fourth quarter, they're starting to see how they're going to get there. So you've got to kind of go back and remind them to keep that balance. Uh, number two, make sure that the expectations are very clear. Uh, if we're going to ask people to, to drive to goals, to have grit towards getting them, they need to understand what they're driving to. Um, Susan David in her book, for example, says that expectations are resentments waiting to happen. If there's expectations, but they're not clear, that's going to create frustration. Frustration tears away at our ability to be resilient or to have grit. Uh, we want to confront uh, fear and anxiety head on. Um, I got this from doing some research on special forces. When our special forces go into what we most of us would consider terrifying situations, the thought that they try and encourage them with is, I'm scared, but I can learn from this, or this is a test that's going to make me stronger. Trying to say like, it's not, you shouldn't be afraid or don't have anxiety. It doesn't work for people. You've got to acknowledge it, but let them know that this is a part of the process and they're, they're going to grow stronger. It's okay to validate feelings as long as we don't get, get stuck in that feeling of I can't move forward, we can validate fear as long as we move on. Um, we need to encourage sort of like courage over comfort sometimes. Uh, they've done some work with uh, neuroimaging that bears that, that when, we're, uh, when we face unknown risks and we're uncomfortable, uh, there's an increased activity in the portion of the brain that also measures rewards. And so um, when we when we only go with the familiar, we tend to break down and not show uh, sort of that that association with reward. In fact, we tend to show more the association with fear. So we want to be encouraged. We want to be challenged. They they teach in some uh, small schools for for elementary kids that you want to follow what they call the teeter totter principle, meaning you want to live at the edge of your ability. We all love that thrill if you're a skier or if. Um, uh, if you're into any speed sports of, of being right on the edge of control, not out of control, but, but the thrill of being able to race and challenge at the full of our capacity. Uh, and then the last part is make sure they've got some resilient role models. This is an area where uh, I think we would all point to Winston Churchill. Again, a lot of ancient names in, in this, but um, you know, if you know anything about Churchill, Churchill suffered huge uh, losses uh, as the head of naval operations and during World War I at Gallipoli, lost a lot of British troops. Uh, and people have wondered, how could he come and stand and be so strong when it came time to, uh, to fight World War II, and, and especially during the Battle of Britain in May of 1940, when they were expecting a German invasion and knew that, that they had uh, very little resistance. And a lot of the scholars who studied Churchill said it's because of the role models that he had, particularly uh, a lot of reading he did with, I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, Thucydides, Thucydides, something like that, who wrote about sort of the ancient Greek wars. And he saw that sort of like need to stand against the odds. And that was what people credit with Churchill becoming the leader that he was during World War II. So look for these things. Try to figure out in your people, where do they have these and where are they missing? Um, and, and where they are missing See if you can encourage by your coaching to bring some of them in. If they if they don't have resilient role models, have a conversation around, you know, who do you aspire that's done great things? And, uh, you know, if you talk to somebody like, or look at somebody like Steve Jobs, right? Great success, but there were failures in that as well. Um, you look at somebody like, um, well, I don't know, just think of the, the different people that we hold up. They all probably somewhere in their life suffered um, failure and, and they had to come back. They had to keep going. Yeah. You know, there's a, a couple of thoughts that come to mind, Russ, as you've been going through these points. Um, first of all, on those expectations, making sure they're clear, um, cannot stress this enough because I see this with organizations on a regular basis. Uh, this is 
something that we can even kind of um, pull out of the assessment. Uh, there's a, a measure of role awareness. And when somebody's got low role awareness, I see this when organizations are going through change, when there's some kind of fear or um, uncertainty, and your, your team members will not understand, they don't have clarity on the expectations. And that's one of the, the pieces of advice that we give is make sure the expectations are clear and walk through, sit down, have a coaching conversation with your direct reports and, and talk through what the expectations are and certainly certain styles, right? Certain disc styles need clearer expectations than others, but this can be a huge, um, a huge concern and it also a huge way to, um, to improve the situation just by, by providing that clarity of, of expectations. And I also think you've kind of uh, proven the negativity bias when you were talking about uh, looking for that balance of positive and, and realistic and, um, you know, a, a person's fear or concern over their goals earlier in the year. And then as it progresses, it gets better. Um, you know, we go to the negative and then we find as we go along that, that things maybe are not so bad as we thought they were going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, if, if Churchill is not your style for someone with resiliency, um, you know, you can study the life of someone like um, Dr. Martin Luther King or uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, who also res uh, were resilient in the face of uh, great uh, oppressive powers um, and have become, uh, you know, role models for people who continued on and who made a difference in our world. So, Russ, I'm going to throw you a question that just came in, because um, I think it's probably one that many of our, um, our attendees can relate to. Uh, we have a, an attendee saying, um, how can I coach a super salesperson who has a poor attitude? Uh, comes into work late, doesn't attend all of the sales meetings, but he's a super performer, but kind of a bad role model to the whole team. Uh, but yet at the same time, his efforts help them make their targets. Yeah, so so that's probably the toughest of all environments where you have someone who is performing, uh, but yet doesn't fit the, uh, the, the the role model or the mold of kind of where you think the team needs to go. And um, you know, we actually we actually talk about this, Michelle, uh, not to do a shameless plug in our book, <laughs> Agile and Resilient, um, around the idea of, boy, sometimes there's the, the, there's these lone wolf folks who think like, just, you know, just mm -hmm. give me a number and, and and the tools and stay out of my way because I'm going to go uh, and I'm going to be successful. And, and I think as a sales manager, um, you've got to understand what's really motivating that individual. In other words, uh, if if they're purely motivated on on their own individual personal success, uh, it's going to be hard to, to to motivate them. If on the other hand they see that they're a part of a team, if they see that if you pair them up with say a rookie who's trying to learn, uh, if they see that they've got some going back to the assessment social motivation, so they've got that ability to want to try and help people. Uh, kind of what is it that drives them to success, and if in pairing, there's there's even different things you can do sometimes with comp to to help help them realize they're going to kind of pull people along. Uh, I think increasingly we make this statement in our book that um, that that lone wolf salespeople tend to to be a dying breed. Um, that more and more uh, companies, our clients, expect us to be working as teams, and uh, so uh, again, pointing out uh, information there can help as well. Um, and I think you've also got to point out through the recognition process that you have when you have sales meetings, be identifying the behaviors that are positive and that you want to see in your team. Um, don't always be giving rewards purely based on who gets the highest results, because that will be then how everyone else sees that they should be successful. Um, lots of lots of different ways to kind of pursue that one. And it's uh, uh, sometimes can be a, a bit challenging. But we are going to talk a little bit here about coaching and kind of where do we want to go. And uh, uh, the, the technique that we want to use here is um, something, um, it's, it's called motivational interviewing. Uh, we call it the probe step in impact. Uh, and there's really some key skills. I talked about that kind of environmental relational perspective of culture. These are the technical skills, right? We want to coach with an open, with open-ended questions. Uh, we want to do very reflective listening where we're 
We're trying to understand the essence of what that individual is looking for or saying. Uh, we want to summarize kind of the key ideas and then get them to react. Uh, and most importantly, get them to craft a situation, uh, or a solution. So if I've got one of these lone wolves who's out there, I'm going to be asking them questions about motivation, where they want to go. Um, I'm going to be listening for the kinds of things that motivate them. And, uh, and, and I don't know that I've ever met anybody who's solely motivated purely by uh, by just the financial aspect. There's other uh, relational uh, aspects that we want. And as you find those, play those ideas back and see how you can bring them in. Uh, but then here's some of the questions that are recommended. Uh, you know, again, if if you're talking about resilience and grit, where do they find joy or satisfaction? I love to ask in job interviews with people, what was the best part of your job? Because I'm looking to see if they have that spark, if they come alive and say, yes, this is what I love doing in a sales role. Um, and so you're, again, trying to connect the, the actions that they've got with, with joy and things that tend to motivate us forward. Um, second of all, does it, does it reflect what's important to you? Does that, that thing that you like about your job drive you and make you feel better? Is it, is it who you are? Uh, a lot of times people will get into situations where they're doing things that are cross counter with their, their values. And so they can do it, but it's grinding. It wears you out. Um, then it's, you're looking for, does it draw upon your strengths? And then do you believe you can really be a success? What we're doing through these questions is getting them to align the why, that's the value piece, uh, getting them to assess sort of the techniques in terms of the strengths that they bring, the skills, if you will. So the why, the skills, and then asking them the question about, do they think they can be successful? Or how do you define success in these roles? Both of those allow you to be able to uh, to, to walk them through the whole process, to put them on a path. Don't think you're going to solve the problem in one coaching call. Don't think you're going to solve it in one conversation, but a little bit more grit grows, resilience grows kind of a step at a time. And that's what we would encourage, um, would encourage you to do and encourage you to look at. Uh, I, I had someone this week who called me uh, a friend. It has nothing to do with work. Uh, and she was going to kind of work with a couple of people at her work who, um, who were having real challenging uh, disagreements and went back to sort of the same outline, right? Like what are the things that they value, get some clarity around the, the, the strengths that they have, and then um, how committed are they to the success of being able to work together or being able to be successful individually and then to what degree did that tie together? So I think these are really useful questions in terms of getting people to understand what it takes to, to really keep going. I love that statement, grit grows. I mean, it, it's it's catchy and I think it just encompasses um, the theme as well. So we are, um, we're at the end of our slide. So I wanna go ahead and, and take some questions. Um, Kurt is asking, what are some ways you can manage grit when that passion and perseverance is low or weak? And, and you know, we may have touched on this a little bit as we've gone through, but any other points for him on that? Uh, I think it's important that you go back to the number one there, right? Where do they find joy? Where do they find satisfaction? If, if grit is leaking, if you will, uh, then I think you've got to help them get back in touch with the joy. Uh, we all get tired of going through the motions and we need and experience sometimes it just sort of resets us in terms of that that true passion. Um, we had another one come in about how do you recommend coaching among peers, um, and that's a uh, th that's more challenging. Um, in this case, though, it's you know a, a, an experienced person with a mentoring one, a younger one. Um, there's a couple of dynamics that are at place there. One of the things that we're seeing cross generational right now is that it used to be that the experienced one did all of the teaching and the, the younger one did all of the learning. And as you look at uh, sort of younger millennials and Gen Z, they want to contribute to that relationship. So try to set them up in environments where they can help each other. We've seen a lot of that over the last few years where more experienced salespeople have helped on the, uh, the, the selling perspective and the younger folks have helped on the technology perspective with different salespeople. And if you can if you can find that balance between the two, uh, that really helps. And then again, I would start by bringing them in together. Talk about why you're pairing them. Uh, praise the strengths if it's grit and resilience or whatever you see in both of them. Um, and then challenge them a little bit to to kind of learn from each other and to grow. 
uh, our work with training, a lot of folks, times people come to class and they think like, you know, I'm an experienced salesperson. I don't really need to learn anything. And what we do kind of early on is talk to them about, look, you've got experience, bring it to the situation. And, and there's probably things that you've just forgotten. And so as a part of that mentoring process, you're going to remember those things. And so that's going to encourage growth uh, and encourage learning. Um, hopefully that will, uh, that'll help. Thank you. And I wanted to also mention, um, you know, we've talked about the assessments a, a little bit over the course of, um, of, of the session. If you're interested in learning more, if you have questions about the assessments, please email us at contact at thebrooksgroup.com. We'd be happy um, to have a conversation with you about that and, um, and the, how useful the tool can be. If there's any other questions, again, please feel free to put those in Q&A or uh, chat. Um, you can also ask, uh, get a copy of the book by emailing us there as well if you'd like to purchase a copy. Um, Russ, I've got a question for you, and I know this is really about coaching to um, grit and resilience, but do you have thoughts on how you can, like good interview questions for how you can identify um, someone's resilience or grit in the hiring process? Um. You know, I'm sure there are the ones that I use, I won't say are necessarily, you know, better than than any other one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like to ask questions about um, how people, um, you know, have dealt with, you know, an account that they thought they were going to win and then they lost. Um, what drove them? What was the outcome of that? Uh, I think that that I like to also ask questions about where did you finish last year and um how does that relate? Like if you didn't finish number one, like why not? And, and, and what were you feeling when you went through that? Um, and then I, I think the, the last one I tend to ask is around um, as it relates to prospecting and as they do prospecting, it's like what motivates you in prospecting and, and how do you, what do you tell yourself? What's the inner voice saying to you when, you know, you've either been on the phone or you've been uh, at a trade show, kind of visiting booths, or you've been knocking on doors and it's four o'clock, what's your inner voice telling you about whether you go home or, or not? And uh, I think through those questions, you tend to get sort of what's driving them and what's their motivation um, and whether they have the, the grit to stick with it. I know that some of the assessments that we do offer up some, some other questions, but those are the three that I tend to use uh, in talking to folks. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that does it for our questions. I was just looking back through chat and it looks like we've covered them all. Um, I want to thank you for joining me today. This has been um, so much fun talking about this topic. I want to thank everyone that has um, attended today. Keep an eye out, number one, the recording for this session will be going out. I believe it goes out um, later this afternoon and we will be back next month, date to be determined with another webinar and a new topic. So thank you all very much for your time today. And thank you, Russ. You're welcome. Great to be with you, Michelle. Thank you everyone for being here.